Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's webinar on AI-powered AI marketing for optimum performance, brought to you by Executive Insights. I'm joined today by a very special panel of industry experts. Joining me is Laurent, Head of Creative Technology at Publicis. Good morning, Laurent. Good morning. Welcome. I'm also joined by Tim Sue, the lead of AI products and solutions at Media Corp. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Great. So before we get started into our content and our exciting speakers that we have today, we wanted to take a quick poll of the audience and just understand if you're currently using AI in your marketing. So please do answer the poll on the screen in front of you. We'll just wait a few moments. Okay, so 47% of us here today are currently using AI in our marketing, which is great. 36% um, isn't, um, and 3% about to embark, not sure how to start. Uh, so quite a varied audience. I think there's going to be a lot of interesting content for us to go through today. So diving into AI, and before we get into our speakers sections, I just wanted to set the scene in terms of how AI is impacting us. Um, I think we have to be living under a rock not to realize that AI is going to impact the way that we live and work dramatically. Um, and I think as an industry, the marketing and advertising industry will be greatly affected, um, one of the most affected industries we will see. Um, and really the acceleration and adoption of AI, it, it's unprecedented. You know, we haven't seen the speed of something expanding so quickly in, in a long time. You know, let's take chat GPT, for example, over 100 million downloads in just under two months making it the fastest growing application in consumer history. So I think, you know, caveating before we go into the content that really this is an arena that is very new to everyone and we're learning as we go along as it's changing and adapting very, very quickly. So the way that we are looking at AI at MediaCorp is really not about replacing jobs, replacing humans, but really how AI can enable us to do things better faster, more cheaply, and at scale. So we really see AI as an enabler for content, allowing us to do things like writing content at scale, creating videos more quickly, using skills such as text to voice, text to video, allowing us to create multimedia faster and at scale. And I think one of the other things that I wanna talk about is really how the products that we have today are going to be vastly different to the products that we have a year from now. And the reason for that is AI is constantly learning and developing. And really, we are still in the infancy of generative AI. So there'll be a lot more to come over the next year. And not just our day-to-day -day lives in terms of how we make business decisions and marketing decisions, but our entire lives are affected by AI. You know, this could be as simple as the recommendations we're receiving on Netflix, the personalized recommendations, and how that's going to continue to become more hyper-personalized um, and more specific to our potential needs. But also the trends we're seeing from Health GPT, where we're having instances where we're going and self-diagnosing ourselves as opposed to going to the doctors. So AI is really that enablement tool throughout our entire life. And I think we should look at it as an area that we can just grow together with and it enables us to do things a lot more quickly at scale and with more data behind it. But one of the things that we're aware of as marketers and businesses is that it's a hugely fragmented landscape, you know, from foundation models and APIs such as chat GPT, which I mentioned earlier, to cross industry applications and then also industry specific tools. So being that it's still a very fragmented landscape, this can be overwhelming for marketers to know where to start. So the five key benefits that I believe will impact us from digital advertising is really around efficient use of data, 
better ad performance and ad spend. So this really goes back to programmatic. Programmatic is nothing new, right, to our ecosystem, but the acceleration of AI is really going to change the way that we buy ads. Um, and we'll see this happening a lot faster than in the past. The second is really around improved decision making. So AI allows us to understand big data at scale very quickly. So that relationship between humans and AI, helping us to make better decisions faster, is going to be one of the key benefits. Another one is around more efficient ad copy and personalized ad creation. So really, we're going to be able to create ads for multi-platforms very fast, very efficiently, and a lot cheaper than we have in the past. And lastly, it's better competitor analysis. So in the past, this technology has been reserved to a few key tech players. Now, what's happened is AI is now in the power of the average consumer. We have so much information available to us. And this allows us to understand our competitors better. I'll give you an example. We have some products like SimilarWeb in the media space, which allows us to understand our competitors' traffic, ad spend, the type of advertisers that are working with them. And this helps us shape our competitive strategy and our commercial strategy. So no business will be immune to this and we'll have access to this information through AI. So the biggest question I then have is, do we trust content that is generated by AI? So a recent study said that 70% of Singaporeans trusted content that was generated by generative AI. And 65% of these Singaporeans also said that they were open to making purchasing decisions based on the AI recommendations. So it's clear to me foundationally, there is trust in AI products already. Um, Salesforce recently did a study to look at factors that would deepen this trust in AI. And 59% said greater visibility into use would deepen their trust in AI and human validation of outputs at 52% as well. So what this tells us is really transparency around the use of AI as well as the human collaboration is going to be the key piece that's going to accelerate the adoption of AI and the trust that we have in that as a product as well. So that brings us into our first speaker, Lorient, to talk a little bit about generative AI and how you're currently using it at Publicis. Thank you, Lacey. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to dive into how we are approaching uh, generative AI at Publicis Group, our philosophy as well, which is largely around the collaboration with uh, machines. Next. So we have one strong belief, which is that AI is not hype. So like previous innovation, it came very fast. It replaced the previous innovation cycles. But this is something that will remain for the foreseeable future. It's also a growth accelerator, meaning that AI is going to create new business model that we cannot even envision today. Next slide, please. Under the umbrella of generative AI, you will find a variety of technology, and then you will have solution, a lot of solution built upon this technology. To give you a simple example, large language model on the left side will be what ChatGPT is, text to image will be what mid-journey or stable diffusion are, etc., etc. Now, the reality of this technology is that they are not all ready right now for scale, but it doesn't mean that they are not ready to be used. So I would classify all this technology in different containers. The first one on the left side will be what you can already use at scale. So large language model like ChatGPT, like Bob, like Claude can be used. Voice cloning is also extremely stable right now and also can be used at scale. Now, when it comes to the rest of the technology in the middle and on the right side, this is a different story. Text to image is amazing. We are seeing amazing outputs from Mijene, for example. Now the reality is that not every single output is perfect on brand, potentially, uh, not on brand potentially as well, and may need post-production corrections and uh, human to actually uh, quality check the result, but it's going to get better and better. And on the right side, you will find 
emerging technology, which are extremely impressive, like text to music or text to video, for example, uh, respectively from Meta, from Google, or from uh, Runway with uh, Gen2. Now, this technology, as amazing as they are, we produce a very minimal amount of good results at this stage. But it doesn't mean that you should not be using them for innovative work or innovative campaign already. Next slide, please. The way we look at generative AI and from my conversation with clients, with colleagues uh, across markets in this region, we are seeing two approach to and two usage of generative AI. It could be that you may want to use it internally. You probably already do that. The survey earlier in, in this presentation was very clear that you are already using it. So you will be using AI for your own productivity. We all do that to some degree, but you may also start thinking or, or started using generative AI for consumer facing uh, needs. So these are two very different sides and that's, this is how we are approaching every single conversation with our client. So next, next slide, please. When it comes to consumer facing generative AI, uh, like explained earlier, we have been using artificial intelligence for a long time. You are using it every day. You may know, not know, but your spam filter, for example, is powered by something like that, by technology that know what is a bad email, for example. So similarly, we have been doing advertising that way by using personal data of individual, we have been able to hyper-target uh, people. So this will be what I would call traditional artificial intelligence. Generative AI on the next slide, please, will bring us two additional dimension, at least, this is a simplification, but the first one will be that you will suddenly be able to create content much faster and there will be much many more variation in this content. So you can imagine that every single one of us would have uh, his or her own uh, visual, for example. So we can generate variation in visual instead of just having visual and potentially copy being personalized. We could actually uh, do that through visuals. But on the right side of generative AI, there is also the possibility, and it's not discussed too much right now, to also create much better digital experience. So anything interactive, website, mobile app, anything else could actually benefit from the use of generative AI solution like large language model to make better ch chatbot, better search uh, engine, for example, better personalized content for individual. So this is something uh, that is coming. Next slide. So we have two case study uh, today, which we are going to show you. The first one is for the, is for the WWF, it's done by Digitas, an agency of publicist group, and it's called Climate Realism. So what it does is that it's uh, combining stable diffusion, an image generator or generative AI image generator, and cl climate change data. And climate change data, excuse me, in this case is the sea level rising and the change in time Temperature that we are envisioning for the future. So once you combine both of that, uh, what would it do, for example, for painting that were uh, painted by famous artists in the past in specific location across Europe? So that project, uh, we will play the case study on the next slide, is just showing the potential of generative AI once combined with other source of data. Let's play, let's play the game. Degrees 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 degrees. We all know the numbers of global warming, but abstract numbers don't move people. That's why WWF wanted to reach them emotionally and make global warming visible in an unseen way. So we turned the numbers into a new art form. Introducing the Climate Realism Exhibition. We took eight of the most famous landscape paintings admired for the style in which they display the beauty of nature. How would these iconic paintings look if global warming is not stopped? How would Vincent van Gogh paint his wheat fields if extreme heat becomes the norm? How would Paul Gauguin paint the South Sea if the sea level rises? We combined three of IPCC's climate scenarios with data from the regions where the landscapes had actually been painted. With a team of scientists, we fed them into custom-built AI pipelines Trained with the style of each artist, nearly 2,000 single frames were generated, showing what would happen to Claude Monet's water lilies, how Tina Blau's coastline would change, and what would remain of Frederick Edwin Church's icebergs. 
step by step, each frame true to the unique style of each artist. By turning Dada into a new art form, people could see and feel the impact of global warming in an interactive digital experience, in a physical exhibition in Berlin, and on digital posters throughout Germany. What numbers alone could not do, climate realism achieved, a new kind of attention, deeper discussions, and an increased urge to act. We all decide if climate realism stays an art form or if it becomes a reality. Thank you. And the second case will be from, from Australia for Honda. So this is a car. What you are looking at is a car that actually tried to sell itself. So uh, the car is called RV. It's actually the launch of Honda HRV in this case. Um, and this car was uh, launched uh, last year and we created a website and over a touch point as well, where you could interact with the car. So you could talk to the car. The car would have a certain range of emotions and the car will, will be able to answer to you through voice. We cloned an Australian actor at the time uh, or through text. So this was done very interestingly before the launch of ChatGPT very early last year when things were still uh, very experimental. I, I think we will just play the case study. We'll explain it very well. Young Aussies spend around 17.6 hours online researching their next car, which can feel even longer considering how bland the experience can be. That's why we created Harvey. One of the first car websites to use voice activate and AI tech to make car buying simpler, funner and quicker. To bring Harvey to life, we partnered with AI specialists and used natural language processing to create an AI brain that could be used across voice, website and chat. We then looked at site analytics, service centre questions and user testing data to determine the types of things young car buyers wanted to know. Things like... How many people can you fit? I can comfortably carry four people or 17 cats. Please don't try to fit 17 cats in me. How much fuel do you use? 4.3 litres per 100 kilometre with my hybrid grade. But as the old adage goes, your mileage may vary. What's adaptive cruise control do? This locks me into the car in front, and I'll slow down and speed up whenever they do. So whether it was features, warranty, or something a little more unexpected, Harvey always had something to say. Oh, say Harvey, what's your favourite movie? The Godfather. Wait, I think a car blows up in that one. Never mind. And Harvey's voice? That was AI too. We cloned local comedian Sam Taunton's voice, allowing for complete creative control. And by combining it with 3D WebGL tech, we were able to create contextually relevant ads and responses in real time. In total, people asked Harvey an average of seven questions. And with over 20,000 conversations in just two months, the hybrid model sold out. So by making the car buying experience quicker, simpler and more fun, we turned Harvey into the car that literally sells itself. OK, enough of a case study. Chat to me now. So let's talk about what we are already doing internally at Publicis Group and what is coming next. So right now, if we look at the range of projects that involve generative AI across our across the APAC region, we are doing a large amount of voice cloning, speech synthesis. We just launched a campaign in India, for example, with Oreo. Uh, we are also integrating large language model like GPT technology in our workflow. So in China, we are actually scripting or creating variation in script using large language model to generate video for Douyin, so the TikTok uh, in China. And we are also integrating large language model to digital experience, such as discussed uh, earlier, where we are make, and we are doing that quite a lot. It's a systematic uh, piece of work in this case, not specifically marketing, but this is also happening. Now, in our labs, next slide, we have um, a few interesting things. So the first thing we are doing is that we are starting to also train AI model like stable diffusion or equivalent on brand assets from our client. What that means is that we will be able very soon to generate 
many, many images of a specific brand and these images will be on, on brand uh, guidelines and uh, will let us create a lot of variation. We are also manipulating video already. As you can see in the middle, we are using technology where we can actually replace people. So it means we may not need a specific actor. We could just use a 3D character, for example, and replace a person in, in a video. This is, these are actually prototypes that we have built ourselves that you are looking at. On the third uh, thumbnails, what you are looking at is a video that we generated from scratch, just from text. So there is no image input, nothing. And this is extremely experimental. It's uh, largely uh, with a lot, uh, giving us a lot of errors at, at the moment, but when it works, it works extremely well. It's very impressive. And we are also starting to create music with solution from such as uh, Meta Audio Craft or the one from Google called Music Language Model and more recently Stable Audio from Stability AI. Next slide. So our perspective is very clear. We believe that the future is really a collaboration in between humans and machine. AI is very far from being autonomous. So you will need human to actually operate this system and how I would say our human value are more important than ever in this case, but our ability to operate this system is also extremely important, which is why generative pra AI practice on the right is extremely essential. And we believe that all of us should actually try this tool or regularly at the same time, start putting proof of concept out there to really understand where the age is uh, with this system. Right, Florian, thank you. I think some of these examples they're very exciting and i think i hear from your advice as well it's you know the best way to get started is just to roll up your sleeves and start experimenting absolutely yeah there's no better time than now to, to get started yeah so lauren as you were speaking there was questions coming in from the q a um, and so i might just direct this first one to you um you know all these exciting solutions you've gone through one of the questions was, can you provide us with a cost estimate for incorporating AI in our strategies so we can gauge how much we need to set aside from our marketing budget? I imagine that's quite a complex question, um, but I think they just want to understand a gauge of what these products could potentially cost. This is a great question. I would say that every case or client conversation I have been involved in was a case on its own, right? Which required a specific discussion to understand, yes, what may it may cost, what solution we may use, what type of team and skills we may need to put on, on this project. I cannot give a range on, on this call because that would be uh, not fair, I guess, to uh, uh, how, how it would work, but the range can be as wide, it can be cheap mm -hmm. or it can be extremely expensive, if I was to say it. Yeah. So it really depends on what the ambition is, the scale, the type of uh, technology that, that will be used. I think yeah. the best in this case is to probably have a separate conversation about yeah. this. With yeah, so so to answer that a, a little bit further, reach out to Lorian or the MediaCorp team and we can advise you on some custom solutions. Um, and I think going back to that, it's really just about what problem you want to solve, right? Not just using AI for the sake of using AI because it's trendy, but what problem can you solve with the use of AI? Um, wouldn't you agree, Lauren? So what problem can I solve, right? That's 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 the question. Yeah, I, I but in my belief, that's kind of the, the whole point around cost. It's not about let's just do everything. Yeah, right. You know, it's like, what problem am I solving? And then what products do I need? to solve that problem is, is a better question than how much do, do things cost, I feel. I think the, the, the value of what we are solving also define the cost, right? Mm. I, that's, uh, I mean, the, the value we will get out of using generative AI to create something, to improve something, to mm. of the productivity, for example, yes, we define, I guess, the cost. Mm. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll have time for more questions for Lorian later. Um, next up, I want to introduce Tim Su. So Tim is our head of AI at MediaCorp, um, and he's going to share a little bit more about how we implement AI into our own strategies. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Lacey. And uh, good morning, everyone, again. So I've seen some great and exciting 
examples from Lawrence on how they are using AI uh, in the marketing stage. So allow me to share a couple of examples of how in MediaCorp we are adopting AI to solve some of the marketing and uh, advertising challenges. So as a, media, uh, as a national media network, so content is actually the bread and butter for us. And we know content is the foundation of marketing. Now, actually in MediaCorp, we started to use AI to generate the short form content, which is even more important in today's marketing. So we have solutions in the uh, processing the news bulletin content. We are using AI solutions to generating the sports clips, which uh, probably there are many fans who have watched the MeWatch and YouTube content provided by MediaCorp. And the other large uh, section is the entertainment space. We're trying to generate more uh, short form content so that we can provide a better a personalized experiences and better marketing experiences. So allow me to go into each, uh, some of the details of these solutions. The first one is actually is the AI smart card. We call it uh, uh, you know, AI smart card. That's the product project name. And it's uh, actually an award-winning AI solution. It's just when the best innovation in the newsroom transformation uh, from Emma this year. Right? So the solution is actually uh, using AI. So it's, the AI system is trained to understand the media cops the news format, our presenter's voice, as well as uh, even the speaker's name. And then it automatically clips out the stories uh, from the over the air news bulletins like Asia Tonight and Singapore Tonight. So the difference is uh, if you're familiar with uh, you know, the CNA content. So the Asia Tonight or uh, Singapore Tonight, that's a news bulletin that contains a series of news stories that's combined together. Typically, it's going to be 30 to 45 minutes. So if you are uh, audiences that you are trying to uh, look for some interesting news to watch, by looking at the title, you probably mm -hmm. don't know what exactly is inside this news bulletin. However, imagine that when we are able to provide you an individual news stories with the right title, with the right introduction, with the right um, thumbnails, then you have a better understanding so that you can easily identify the content that you will be interested to watch. So that is the AI, how the AI is basically powering those solutions and as well as creation of those content. We don't need to manually do the clipping. So the system, the AI system will automatically do that for us. We can providing a better and also the personalized watch experiences with the help uh, from the metadata arrangement and also probably a bit of like recommendation systems. So that is the first one I would like to share. And if let's say there are, uh, I'm pretty sure today we have uh, a lot of like sports fans or football fans, you probably watched the uh, the FIFA World Cup last year. Uh, probably you watched on MeWatch or YouTube. You may notice that this year we introduced quite a few of new features like on, on MeWatch. For example, you can follow your favorite teams, your favorite players. We introduced more content reels, like the goals, the saves, the penalties, the highlight of the games, the highlight of the players, or even the key moment from a certain groups. So those are the con th this are all due to the content generated by our AI powered sports clip generation. So we use AI to analyze and also to basically process all the 64 games and matches across the whole World Cup period. And basically we generate the clips automatically, looking at the different uh, key actions, like a goal, like a save, like penalty, and publish that almost in real time. You probably noticed that you have watched on YouTube uh, when there is a goal happening. So the content will be available on MeWatch or on YouTube after a few seconds. So you can watch, as mentioning earlier, you can actually follow your favorite players and just focus on what you are interested on. Uh, let's say Macy fans, you can watch all the highlights about around Macy in different stages, right? So AI actually brought quite um, you know, different benefit in this area, right? So we can help the product team, as mentioning earlier, the MeWatch team to better design and giving a richer um, designs to the audiences. And from the audiences, you have a better and all more personalized experiences. Right? You can 
more focused on what your interests are. It's very easy. It's very, um, you know, uh, I would say smooth, right? To, to find what you are interested on. And then from the internal content team, it's also in, help them to in, increase the efficiencies to generating those clips. Imagine if you want to go with a <clears throat> manual approach, how much resource is going to be invested on. And, uh, and lastly, of course, from the marketing and advertising point of view, because we have more viewers, we have more audiences, then it's, that's also easier to have more monetization uh, opportunities. And those are all from the content generation point of view. And I also want to share with you one example of the generative VI space. I think it's very, it's very aligned with what Lauren was just now was sharing, right? So I'd like to introduce you, Mike, who is a new MediaCorp member. So Mike is a very friendly AI voice assistant uh, for the audio sale, audio ads space. Think about this way, right? So it's, you can use Mike in a very simple web page, put down your script, select the speaking styles, whether it's going to be upbeat, friendly, or even side or whispering. So different speaking styles, then just to click the generate audio. After seconds, you will have the audio generated for you. Imagine you are a marketeer, basically working with voiceover talent to generating some audio ads uh, for some marketing campaigns. Traditionally, you're probably going to engaging with voiceover talent over a couple of days back and forth. And it's more challenging when you have a much tighter timeline. And suddenly, that might be a content change in that marketing. So how are you going to do that? There's a huge dependence in the content, in the voiceover talent. With Mike, with your friendly AI voice assistant, so you can use the tool to generating that demo just in seconds, and you can change it whenever you need it. So it's give you a more efficient, a more timely, and more, um, you know, in terms of managing your, even your cost. I think that's the benefit that you can receive or you can expect from Mike. So let's hear what Mike can say um, in the different speaking styles or different tunabilities. Right? The first one is actually a warm mic. Here at Future Proof 2023, we'd like to show everyone a bright and hopeful future that welcomes all of us, enabled by intelligent technology that understands and connects with us on a deeper level. And let's hear another cheerful voice from Mac. Here at Future Proof 2023, Sorry, that's, uh, let, let's just go back to that slide and I'm going to play this cheerful. Um, sorry, just uh, give me a second. Jay, are you able to help me to just to click on the cheerful mic? Ah, here it is. Here you go. Gentlemen. Welcome to the Future Proof 2023 event. I am your friendly AI voice, Mike. Allow me to show you the possibilities that AI will bring in the days ahead and let's embrace the future together. What do you think about Mike? Actually, we are about to adding different voices, different gender, and even covering the different aging so that you can have multiple uh, voices for to choose to select with different uh, speaking styles. Right. With that, I think to me as a AI, I was a professional in the space. Uh, you know, for uh, more than ten years. I think this is really a dream come true moment, especially when today we're talking about the generative AI, uh, chat GPT, mid journey, video generation, music generation. Right. So we've seen. Such intelligent systems, previously only in those movies. You've seen, seen how Jarvis is helping Iron Man to do, uh, to assist him making decisions, to assist him to, you know, do different things. We have seen similar intelligent systems, robots, uh, computers, right, in many different type of movies, right. Today, with generative AI, I think I also want to touch a little bit on the question in in the co costing. I think it doesn't really. And it costs you much to start 
to use AI, to use generative AI. Think about ChatGPT. It's free. You can use it for free. You can try it yourself, understand AI, and see that how you can link that AI into your own um, space and define your own AI strategy. It actually becomes your own AI assistant. You know, from the marketing point of view, I think Lacey and Lauren have highlighted that help you to generate personalized content can increase the engagement, improve hugely on the efficiencies. Think about how we are generating the content across a different type of content and different type of you know categories and how that is basically helping us to drive those different reaches and viewerships as well as you know the monetization opportunities. So with that, that's I think um, um, I'll pass back to Lacey. Thanks, Tim. Um, I think very exciting. I know that everyone's very interested to learn more about Mike. Um, I think even from the digital team, we've been very excited about how we can utilize that to create audio ads faster with more versions for our clients. Um, there was a question on, I believe, from Philip around, you know, the 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 cost, ballpark cost it would cost for basic AI, AI solutions. You rightly mentioned ChatGPT, you know, they don't cost any money. You know, for example, for Mike, there's solutions available, you know, for $3,000, which includes creation of the ads, but also the media placement on digital audio as well. So they are by no means um, not affordable for businesses um, to start utilizing AI. Um, Tim, why I have you here, I want to ask another question that came in during the chat, during your presentation. And this one was really around um, how much manpower reviews, checks, and approvals are required for the AI-generated sports clips. Um, currently, and also the second part of that is currently the quality of clips that are generated, are they ready for publishing? Are they perfect? Or is there still some work to be done? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I think this is, a, I would say this is a common um you know, questions that are related to any of those like AI systems, how do we really automate a whole workflow, right? So the short answer is, it's a very straightforward solution. So exactly you give in the stream, the streaming URL, the system will listen in, watch the stream, watch the basically different actions according to what is happening in the football court, right? In this case, the football court and capturing all the different actions and do that uh, processing and clipping in almost real time. So that generation is actually is fully automated, meaning mm -hmm. you don't need to having any human in the intervention. However, the question I guess is from the clips generated, how good is the quality, right? So mm -hmm. of course AI is 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 not today of the AI is still not um hundred percent accurate, right? You mm -hmm. still need to basically uh adding a bit of a human QC, right? But after you basically familiarize how the AI works, the patterns, right? So what are the typical areas? You just need to focus and check. You don't need to basically check on every single clip that generated because you already know the pattern, right? So how, where are the areas that could potentially having certain uh, issue, right? So mm -hmm. you just need to click on that part, make sure that is uh, properly clipped, right? For example, don't have a cutoff from the commentaries, right? But mm -hmm. those are the also technically softball by iterative training your AI system, right? Then it's a decision whether, you know, uh, you just need to like one or two QC people, uh, make sure that when you publish it, it's all matched with the expectations, right? So it says that the human, the manpower put there is very minimum but you need to have a long-term planning how you basically iteratively to improve the different areas based on your own need mm -hmm. you probably need to think about whether the commentary is more important for your audiences or you know where the cutting off is more important for your mm -hmm. you know uh publishing right when you do the publishing the content i think that will be tailored by your own ai strategy but in general i would say it's very smooth uh, you just need to involve a minimum, um, you know, effort from the from manual side, from human side, human resource side. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, Tim. So, leading on from that, I have a, another question for you. So, it seems like there's so many products and solutions within the generative AI 
space. And, you know, I presented that slide earlier, which showed the amount of tools that are available for marketers. I'm, I'm curious whether you know or you believe there's going to be a enterprise level solution that is a one size fits all, um, which will come out or will the industry continue to be very fragmented? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's another really great question. I mean, this is something I've been dealing with every day, right? As, as I'm working with enterprise, which is in this case, it's, it's media corporate. So there's a lot of different considerations we need to have when we are doing the AI adoption and implementation. For example, I mean, the, the, the key topics are around data protection. How do you make sure, right? You know, when you started to use AI, your data was protected, not being leaked uh, accidentally to the public or to the other you know, AI algorithm. I think we heard a lot on how the incidents around chat GPT, right? Mm -hmm. And around copywriting infringement, how do you make sure that those, you know, generated outcomes are, you know, following certain guidelines, right? Have, uh, have some kind of like, uh, you know, governance uh, frameworks, right? Then for most, most importantly, you're ta we're talking about enterprise level of solutioning, and then the scalability is super important. You know, personally, you can use chat GPT, you can use mid journey to generating, you know, the different content from text to image to other type of content. But when you are, when we are talking about, you are implementing a solution for the enterprise, then that's a different level. You need to think about scalability, you need to think about the long-term support and maintenance and also potentially the governance piece, right? That is super important. Mm. And from what I see in the market, um, just to take the chat GPT and also the relationships between Microsoft uh, and OpenAI, I think that's a good example because OpenAI released chat GPT, which is more of consumer facing product. But later, I think because they are partnering with Microsoft, so Microsoft integrating the GPT, uh, the large language models, as well as, as other uh, generative AI tools like image generation, right? Into the Azure so-called the cloud, um, the enterprise cloud platforms so mm -hmm. that you can build such um, enterprise level solutions based on your own needs. I think that's a huge improvement. And also from, you know, the, the, the content protection, the copywriting protection point of view, I think if we uh, following the trends, I think recently Microsoft released their plan, how they basically make sure, uh, you know, you can use the, you know, the generative AI solutions um, without varying too much on the potential damage because of copyright infringement, because they are mentioning if you are using their co-pilot product and you are using their content filtering, right? So whenever there's a case that you have damage caused by the content generated from their system, they're going to pay you for that damage. Mm. I see that as potentially a trend where the industry is going in because when we talk about enterprise, that we were talking about all the different governance and the ethical uh, part of it. I think that potentially ease that concern in, to a certain extent. That's a great answer, Tim. And and maybe, Laurent, I think let's talk from an agency level um, as well. So there was a couple of questions that came up in the chat um, specific to agency partners. Um, what are the internal guidelines and guardrails put in place for the use of Gen AI in your work? And what are the main principles you feel every agency need to put in place or formalise? I, I think it goes back to the previous question around enterprise solution. Mm. So there are a lot of amazing solutions uh, in the generative AI space. We, we talked about mid-journey, for example, amazing, but it's not practical for enterprise needs or for most of our clients, for, for example. So we cannot use that at scale right now. So the gal race will be extremely similar to what was described around why enterprise solutions are required in this space. So we are doing the same thing. We are making sure we are not uh, damaging the our client's brand, for example, or losing their data. So all of that means we need to pick the solution the right way. We need to have a process that is uh, uh, very specific to the use of this solution. So uh, again, we are dealing with extremely large clients on our side. So that means this is a must, right? There is no work around to that. So the enterprise solutions are really uh, what we start 
working, working with. We are also developing our own solution internally where we are building tools from scratch ourselves because sometimes we have very, very specific needs. But similarly, this tool will be built the same way this enterprise tools uh, will be done as well. So it's all about being uh, thinking from an enterprise level all the mm. time. Mm. So I don't know if that answered the question around the gal rates, but this is what we do. Mm. And Lauren, just to add to that, I mean, there's a lot of conversation that we read around the ethical implications of implementation of generative AI. Um, yeah. You know, there's also questions around the amount of power it used, how sustainable it is. Um, is there any comments that you'd like to make on that? So, so I, I would say, yes, but we always tell our clients that they are a future with generative AI to have in mind. A lot of our clients, for example, have sustainability, sustainability sorry, as a as a brand pillar for them. And then how does what does it mean if we start using Gen AI or even before blockchain, for example, that use all this energy in the cloud, but in, in the end uh, may not be sustainable in some case. So we are having this conversation with them. We are ensuring that everything is green or sustainable, even from a stack perspective, because this is actually possible. So I would say when we pay attention to that, uh, Gen AI is not going to consume less energy. I don't think so. So it's more about how can we be sustainable, let's say, starting from the data center and there are solutions out there. Google, for example, let you choose. Uh, there's a drop down when you pick a data center on Google Cloud, and it will ask you, do you want a green or carbon friendly data center versus a non carbon friendly. So, so that's possible. But we have seen, yes, we have seen company announcing their sustainability result recently, tech company. Uh, and it shows that more water is consumed, for example, in some of the data center as a result of the use of this system. Uh, that, that's number one. So, your first question was on the Sustainability and and I think ethical implications as well, biases and uh, yes, massive issue there which uh, exist uh, still have been fixed. I would say over the last uh, couple of years uh, as this developed. But yes, you may go into a generative image tool and ask for a specific type of image, and you will see the bias immediately. Mm -hmm. So the, bi the, the bias may be that you want something and then you get what is typic the typical answer to that something, there will be no variation. And this will also happen with large language model with chat GPT. So it goes back to the bias being the actual group of humans who have trained this system. So their bias are being transmitted to the data set. And then obviously it's transmitted to the AI that is trained on that data set. So there are, there are many companies, there are many um, uh, policies, I would say, in place to, to look at that. That would be part of the quality check, most likely as well, to ensure that there are no bias. Yeah, so, so the third-party verification is, is a big part of that, I imagine. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Uh, so let me just check the panel. Um, we might have time for one more question. Um, before we close. And then the rest of the questions, uh, I'll work with the panelists to answer via email um, and we'll send that out after the session. Um, so let's start with, let's just do some closing thoughts. Um, maybe, Lauria, just some closing thoughts on the impact of AI on marketing, um, you know, in the next two years. Maybe just a, a few sentences of that. So... Our perspective is, and I go back to probably my last slide, where we believe we are going to move into different roles internally in our organization as we do marketing with this system, with these machines or these robots. We have a kind of few terminology for, for, for them. Um, we are going to operate this system. So we need to move, we need to elevate ourselves. Uh, this is quite philosophical, but we need to our humanity need to show, right? We mm -hmm. can compete with machines. So it's really about collaboration with systems like that to augment our, ourselves. Um, 
And yes, driving them in the right direction. So we are all responsible in a way of where AI may go. Uh, at the same time, what is going to happen and how what our industry needs to do is to also look very closely at guidelines provided by government, media authority, etc., across different markets, because it indicates what we should or should not do. I think it's 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 quite important to be always on this uh, looking at this guideline. Um because AI is an extremely powerful system. I mean, it will be even more powerful as we go forward. So we need, we are, I would say the, we need to benefit from that. We were losing control. Yeah. So, so that, that's what I anticipate will happen. We need to be very familiar with the system and operate them uh, going forward. Yeah, great answer. Uh, um, Tim, in terms of the business impact of AI in the next few years, is there anything you want to add to that before we close? Uh, I think uh, to me, AI is definitely not the future. AI is now, is what is happening. I think it's, it's everywhere. I think uh, the most important thing is don't don't afraid of it. Try to embrace it. Try it yourself and build up your own strategies to, you know, to really utilize it, become your assistant, like how the, the movies is doing. I think the most importantly as well is the businesses need to have a proper governance policies. That is the super important. That will ease the different fears and resistance across the you know the businesses like, and that also give them the clear clear direction where and what are the use cases and how you should uh, use the different AI tools mm -hmm. and clear idea like how that kind of benefit you know the businesses and you know the areas. Mm, great, great answer. I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I want to thank my wonder, wonderful speakers, Laurie and Tim. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Executive Insights. Yeah.